Well, once again, good morning, Emmanuel Faith. It is so good to be together. If you're new, I just want to say welcome. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're joining us online, we are really grateful that you're worshiping with us as well. You know, today we're continuing our summer series in the book of Proverbs that we're calling Masterclass Expert Advice on Living Well. And the book of Proverbs in our Bible is chock full of practical application for daily living. The book of Proverbs is meant certainly to be studied, but it's not meant to be left on the shelf. It is meant to be applied in our real everyday lives. And you're probably aware that while Proverbs are included in the scriptures, Proverbs are not limited to the scriptures. So in our culture and throughout cultures of all time, they have had different Proverbs. So what is a proverb? A proverb is simply a short, pithy statement about the, way, about the way that the world generally works. Proverbs are principles, not promises. Here's why that matters. That last line matters. Because we don't read through the book of Proverbs sort of looking to name it and claim it. We look through the book of Proverbs to figure out how has God wired the way, world to work and what does it look like for us to align our lives with that truth. Now, you might read something in Proverbs and go, it doesn't work that way every time. And Solomon would say back to you, you're right. They're principles, not promises. That'll be really important for us to keep in mind this morning. You know, shortly after the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a vocational phenomenon that started to take place in our nation. Uh, many sociologists started to call it the great, anybody know? The Great Resignation, exactly. And in 2021, the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics stated that 47 million people voluntarily left their jobs. It was an unprecedented mass exit from the workforce that many presume was spurred on by COVID-19. Now, there's a number of different reasons for this, not the least of which being some requirements for the vaccine, overwork of frontline workers during the pandemic. Those who were close to the age of retirement said, I think it's time, right? Uh, there were those who moved to different states, people who were struggling to find childcare in order to stay in the workforce, and a number of different reasons. Some would argue that it was because, also because the government was giving us quote unquote free money, but that wasn't enough to maintain a household for all that long, was it? So in the wake of the great resignation, we see work shortages everywhere. My guess is that you've experienced this and going to a restaurant that you like, and maybe that restaurant cut back on hours. And if you ask the manager or the owner, why in the world did you cut back on hours? One of their reasons was we just simply can't find enough people to work. Churches aren't exempt from this reality either. We've seen in the quote unquote post pandemic world, if we are in fact post, that people just aren't signing up to serve and volunteer in the ways that they were before. Quite honestly, I think that we got comfortable not being involved in, well, the world. I mean, there's a part of us that's just sort of waiting to say, what does it look like to re engage? And this might be a gross exaggeration, and if it is, Forgive me, but it seems as though people just don't want to work hard. That's the sense that I have. And if this feels a little bit like a get off my lawn sermon, I apologize for that. It's truly not intended to be that way, but it does feel a bit like people don't want to work hard. I mean, in a survey done of 13 to 17 year olds just a few years ago, the number one job that 13 to 17 year olds said that they wanted was, any guesses? A YouTuber, exactly. Now, we have a YouTuber that calls Emmanuel Faith his church home, and I just want to assure you that being a YouTuber is a lot more work than it looks like on the video, right? But, but, Kids are thinking, I think I'd love to do that. I make a lot of money, and I don't have to work all that hard. Now, before we're too hard on the next generation, let me just remind you that it was my generation that made Tim Ferriss' book, Four Hour Work Week, subtitle, Escape 9 to 5, Live Anywhere, and Join the New Rich, a New York Times bestseller in 2007. So we're all in this together, you guys. And my question 
is simply, is hard work a relic of the past? Is hard work a relic of the past? It seems as though we have a latent desire to escape hard work. And maybe that's because we spend roughly one third of our life at work. 90,000 hours of our life, on average, we will spend in the workforce. That's probably why somewhere a number of decades ago, this idea formed that you have to be passionate about your work. And that is a fairly new idea. People used to find meaning in their work and contributing to the common good and providing for their family. But now we want to be passionate about what we do. I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. I'm just pointing out that it's new. But I do think that there is this sort of ingrained within us, this um, polarity of struggle that we seem to have with work. And on one side of the polarity is turning work into an idol. That we bow down to the throne of productivity and work. We find our meaning and purpose, and we find our identity in what we do. You go up to somebody at a party and say, hey, tell me about yourself. My guess is that they will say what they do for a living. But I think on the other side of that polarity, that it starts to swing to the other side, and instead of making work an idol, making work an idol, we just become idle. We just hit pause. And we don't want to work hard. And so my question is, is work evil? Is it wrong? It is work to be an idol. Are we supposed to find our identity in what we do? Well, it may not surprise you that the scriptures speak to the subject of work. And in the very first chapter of the Bible, God starts to tell us about what it looks like to be people who work. It says this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them, speaking of human beings, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and what? Subdue it and have what? Dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the ground. Subdue and have dominion. God creates, but then he hands cultivating his work over to human beings. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it'll go on to say, The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to what? To work it and to keep it. So it turns out, that work is a part of, catch this, paradise. So if our view of work is, it's wrong or bad or evil, or we want to avoid it, I just want to suggest to you that if we don't like work, we might not like heaven. Because work is a part of God's design before sin ever enters into the picture. Now, you can read about the way that Sin made work harder than God originally designed and less enjoyable, and that's all true and all part of the story. But what I want you to grasp onto is that part of God's original design for human beings is that we would be people who work. I would argue that work is wired into our being. I love the way that pastor and author Tim Keller put it when he said this in his great book, Every Good Endeavor. If you want to read one book on work, that's my suggestion. That's for free. Okay, here we go. (laughs) Work is as much a basic human need as food, beauty, rest, friendship, prayer, and sexuality. It is not simply medicine, but food for our soul. And according to the Bible, we don't merely need the money from work to survive. We need the work itself to survive and to live fully human lives. See, work is a part of being human. It's part of the way that we contribute to the flourishing of our families, of our communities. And it is part of the way that we partner with Jesus as he renews all things. We need to find something to put our effort to, to put our hand to, to produce, to keep, and to provide. And because it's part of our wiring, I'd suggest to you that it would do us well to figure out a healthy relationship between what it looks like to be human and to be somebody who works. Amen? Amen. So if you have your Bible, open with me to the book of Proverbs, because it may not surprise you, but a book all about wisdom has a major theme about our work. 
And Solomon really starts to unpack this theme in chapter 6, and then it's going to show up all throughout the book of Proverbs after that. But look at the way he began, starting in verse 6 of chapter 6. Are you there? Awesome. Here's what Solomon wrote. He said, go to the, what? Ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Now, in case you're wondering, this is not a compliment, okay? Nobody read this and was like, I got to get a tattoo of that one, right? Or a coffee mug, none of that. This is a little bit of a, uh, Solomon's pushing back on us and he calls whoever's reading this uh, a sluggard. It's a word that is derived from the idea of people being like a slug. And here's a picture (laughs) of my youngest son, Reed, going up to lick a banana slug. Now this is a thing up in Santa Cruz. Can anybody verify this for me and testify? Okay, good. Yeah, so if you see a banana slug, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go up to it and either lick it or he's giving it a very romantic kiss. Um, (laughs) Kiss it and then what happens is your lips or tongue start to go just a little bit numb. It's something fun that they do up north, okay? (laughs) And Solomon says, Some of us resemble a slug, meaning we're slow moving, meaning maybe a bit on the lazy side. And it implies somebody who maybe lacks a little bit of initiative and and motivation. By contrast, Solomon says, okay, here's what I want you to do. Look Look at the slug, and then I want you to look at the ant. By contrast, the ant is fast moving, hard working. In fact, did you know that ants each gather their own food, they gather more than they need to survive, and they refuse to steal from other ants? I guess there's a a high morality factor amongst ants. That if an ant is carrying a piece of food, drops it, if his scent is on it, the other ants will leave it alone and wait for them to come back and get it. Pretty sophisticated little beings. (laughs) And Solomon says, the better part of wisdom is to live much more like the ant than like the slug. Or we might say it like this, that the life we long for requires hard work we often resist. It's why Solomon's bringing this point up. He calls him, oh sluggard, hard, meaningful, good work is a part of the good life that we crave. So if life is going to be all that Jesus designed it to be, if we're going to live in his way with his heart, then good work is going to be a part of that equation. Now, before you start to think, oh my goodness, I wish Bob were here. Or, oh my goodness, Mary needs to really hear this message, right? Before we start to go, okay, how many are doing that, honestly? Like there's somebody you work with and you're like, I'm going to send them this message right? So before we go there, one of the things I was convicted about, because I started to sort of go there in my own mind, but then I read this term that just really hit home with me and convicted me. It's the term selective sluggardliness. And here was the author's point, that a lot of us, we work really, really hard in one area of our life. It might be in that 90,000 one-thirds department that we call work. We work really hard in that area. But maybe we're not quite as disciplined in some other areas of our life. He went on to give a few examples. Here's what he said. Selective sluggardliness might look like the dad who sets sales records at work and shoots a four handicap on the golf course, but fails miserably to respond to the emotional needs of his wife and kids. Or maybe it's the mom who pours herself out on the job or home front, but who neglects her own relationship with God and her own soul. Or maybe it's the highly relational men or women who fill their time with people but never tend to their own inner lives. Or maybe it's the person that works really hard and makes really good money but refuses to develop a budget to actually manage that money. Or maybe it's the person who sits in church every Sunday and hears a beautiful, wonderful message from their pastor (laughs) but then just goes back to Monday morning routine as it's always been. I don't know, can you relate to some of that? That maybe this is for you, even if you're a really hard worker. Maybe there's an area that God would put his finger on as we study and challenge you. See, it takes work to make a marriage strong. 
Amen? It takes work to care for a home. It takes work to develop strong friendships, as we talked about a few weeks ago. And I think it's easiest to focus on making a living, and that is important, and that is a distinct part of what Solomon is writing about when he talks about work in Proverbs, but it's not the only part of our lives where we work. So it's important for us to say, God, what would you say to me through this? And what does it look like for us to go to Ant Academy rather than sluggard school? I'm so glad you asked. Let's keep reading. Verse 7, listen to what Solomon went on to write. He said, Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, the ant prepares their bread in summer. What's he saying? Nobody's telling the ant to get to work. Nobody's saying, okay, it's, it's time to go start gathering food. Let's go. Nobody's waking the ant up going, pep talk, today's the day. We're going to go gather food. The ant on its own takes initiative. How many of the parents in the house wish kids would respond to cleaning their room in the same way? Right? Who's with me? Right? Yeah. We call those angels, not children. All right? So the sluggard in contrast to the ant who's taking initiative, my guess is the sluggard is the king of excuses. He's got one for every selfish thing he does. Thank you, DC Talk. Right? And the sluggards have an ability to come up with excuses to avoid taking initiative to actually work. Listen to one example that Solomon humorously gives in Proverbs 22, verse 13. He writes, the sluggard says, there, there is a lion outside. I shall be killed if I go into the streets. I couldn't possibly go to work today. I might get mauled on my way there. Right? And, and Most scholars point out the fact that we're supposed to read this and chuckle a little bit because getting mauled by a lion on the way to work in first century Israel was almost as uncommon as it is getting mauled by a lion on the way to work today. It's just not going to happen. But the challenge with people who make excuses rather than take initiative is that they often believe their own excuses. Uh, James T. Draper pastor and commentator puts it like this, the saddest thing a lazy person believes is their own excuses. And so what's Solomon's um, impetus for us, what's his challenge for us, is that we would be people who take initiatives rather than making excuses. The ant knows what it needs to do. It needs to eat, and it doesn't wait for somebody else to tell it. Now, I think that there are a few things that can sort of hold us up by from being people that take initiative. Let me give you four quick ones. Number one, in the church and amongst church people and people who believe in God and want our lives to honor him, we have a tendency to avoid initiative by using theology. And we might say something like, I'm just waiting on God. I'm just waiting on God. And let me ask you, is that a biblical idea? Yeah, it absolutely is. To wait on God is a biblical idea. To do nothing while you're waiting is not biblical, right? That we keep working while we're waiting. We we are faithful in the assignment that we have while we wait for God to give us another assignment. We go until we get a no, but just sitting on our hands, waiting on God is not what the scriptures mean when they talk about that idea. Here's a second thing. Here's a second thing that causes us to maybe not take the kind of initiative that God would have us take. It's that we wait for the perfect time to start something. Proverbs in his other, or sorry, Solomon in his other book, Ecclesiastes, would write it like this. He says, he who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. What does he mean by that? Well, if you're a farmer and you go out and you look, or sorry, try to discern the wind and you look at the clouds trying to find the perfect time to plant the field You'll be waiting forever, he says. You just got to start. You just got to start. For us, it might mean taking a job that isn't our ideal job and then working our way up. I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. And this is where the get off my lawn sort of comes in. I think there was a, in, in, in generations that have gone before us, there was an assumption built into working that we weren't always going to get our dream job. 
Yeah, amen. And, the, and then here, let me just throw something else out. You take it or leave it. There might be a part of your job that you don't love. I, I know, I'm just saying. And that was the assumption, I think, for my parents and their parents' generation. But I'm reminded of what Cousin Eddie said in Chris's vacation. He'd been out of work seven years. And he said he was holding out for a management position. And if we wait for the perfect opportunity, we might just be waiting forever. Here's the third thing that often prevents us from taking initiative. We mistake talking about working with working. And here's the thing, this isn't any fault of ours. Our brains are actually wired, they've done studies on this, that when you talk about something a lot, you actually trick your mind into thinking you're doing it. But the reality is you're just talking about it, which I think is why Solomon would write, in all toil there's profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty. And it turns out that talking about working and actually working was an issue back in Solomon's day as well. Uh, Can I just add, I think we do this sometimes with discipleship. There's a fear that I have that the more we talk about discipleship, we actually trick our brains into thinking we're becoming disciples, living in the way of Jesus, with the heart of Jesus, becoming people of love. The more we talk about sharing our faith, we actually trick our brains into thinking we're actually doing it. But the reality is we might not be doing it. We might just be talking about it. And so I just want to encourage you to just, just think on that. And then finally, I think we mistake wanting something with working for something. Because here's the deal, wanting something takes energy. Have you ever wanted something so much that it kept you up at night? You desired it so much? And wanting something is actually a way that we prevent ourselves from working for something. I mean, that's what Solomon would say in Proverbs chapter 13, verse four. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied, craves and gets nothing. So if you only have a limited amount of energy, we have to decide what we're gonna do with it. Are we gonna talk or are we gonna toil? Are we gonna want or are we gonna work? And maybe just maybe we don't have enough energy to do all of those things well. So if we're gonna be people that take initiative, we might just say back to Jesus today, Jesus, is there anything, is there anything in life right now that I have been sort of just waiting to take initiative about and making excuses about that you're saying it's time to start. Maybe it's beginning to move towards that adoption or doing foster care or partnering with Family Strong and you've, you've been thinking about it for a long time and maybe just maybe Jesus is saying today's the day. Maybe you've been wanting to work on a book and, and you've been putting it off and maybe Jesus would say today's the day or wanting to start that house project, or better yet, wanting your spouse to have you start that house project, okay? (laughs) Maybe, Maybe this is a word from the Lord. Today's the day, today's the day. Maybe it's starting to get in shape, or maybe it's going back to school to get the education that you want in order to get the job that you're working towards. Maybe today's the day. And that goes right in line with what Solomon would say next in verse eight. He says, She, speaking of the ant, prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. And this is a really interesting comment because I think what Solomon wants us to see is that the ant has a very clear goal in mind, food, food, food. But the ant is also wise enough to recognize that there is a short window of opportunity when they're gonna be able to collect enough food in order to survive. And if they miss that window, it's gonna hurt them in the long run. Maybe we'd say it like this, that every season has work that's befitting that season that needs to be identified if we are going to live into the abundance that Jesus designed us for. Or you could put it like this, that we've got to have our priorities straight and we cannot let procrastination get the better of us. I was gonna talk about procrastination more, but I think I'll put that off and do it a little bit later. (laughs) Just kidding. Thank you for laughing at that. I am a dad and have a few dad jokes, so. You know, it's really interesting, this idea of procrastination. I'm reading a book right now. Um, It's Walter Isaacson's biography of Leonardo da Vinci. 
And da Vinci was quirky and brilliant, like as brilliant as they came. But one of the things that was unique about da Vinci is that he had an issue with what some might call chronic procrastination. I mean, he just did. In fact, the reason that we have so few completed da Vinci paintings is because he was such a procrastinator. He often required sharp threats by the patrons that he was working for in order to actually finish a painting. It took him 15 years to finish Mona Lisa. Worse, it took him 25 years to finish Virgin on the Rocks, and he was originally given seven months to complete it. Can you imagine being graduated from high school for 25 years and then going back to your English teacher and saying, here's my paper, I finally got it done. (laughs) That's a bold move, is it not? 25 years, in fact, on his deathbed, da Vinci apologized to quote, God and man for leaving so much undone. And before we're too hard on da Vinci, can we just admit, we all have a little bit of da Vinci in us. Like maybe not the prolific artist part, but certainly the procrastination part we can relate to. And our way that we procrastinate may not be the same way that da Vinci procrastinated, but ours might be social media or Netflix or, I mean, you name it, right? There's ways that we off, put off working. But here's the thing. I just want you to remember back to when, and if you still are in school, this won't be hard, but remember in school when you had a paper due. Do you remember that? And then raise your hand if you had a tendency at times to procrastinate writing a paper. Yeah, me too. But here's what I want you to recognize. My guess is that when you were procrastinating writing a paper, you were actually thinking about the paper that the paper was dancing in the back of your mind. And so even as you put off the work, you couldn't really get away from it and you couldn't actually rest. And so I think one of the things that the scriptures are teaching us is, is how to drink the most from the life that God has given us. And it's to prioritize our time and to put off procrastinating. It's why the apostle Paul would write to the church in Ephesus and say, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the most or making the best use of the what? Time. Because the days are evil. And as you read through the scriptures, there are two Greek words that are often translated time. One of them is chronos. Will you say that with me? Chronos. And the second is kairos. Will you say that with me? Kairos. Chronos is like chronology. It's like time that you see on a clock. But kairos is a different type of time. It's like opportunity. Kairos is a moment that comes where you have to be ready to act. And if you're unable to act in that moment, you very well may miss the opportunity and it might not come back around. And when Paul writes about redeeming the time or making the best use of the time, any guesses which word he's using? Kairos. Kairos. And he's echoing what Solomon writes in the Proverbs that certain assignments are time-bound. They will not last forever. So let me just um, try my best to give a word to all the parents who are in the house. Because I think this is a word for parents. It's a word for everybody, but specifically and uniquely applying this idea to parents that our kids will only be in our house for a short 18 or so years, right? And we can't procrastinate pouring love into them, speaking blessing over them, training them up in the way of the Lord, shaping and forming, helping to shape and form their hearts. They value the right things, teaching them how to follow Jesus, that we can't put those things off. We can't procrastinate on those things. It is a time-bound assignment or invitation. 
And it has to be a priority. The challenge is that that, off, that, prior, that invitation often comes at the exact same time that careers are beginning to be more demanding and taking extra from us. And so we have to be wise in the way that we manage our time. It seems to me that the ant fights through distraction and fights against procrastination and prioritizes what's most important in the season. And I think we have to do the same. So what is it that's most important of your season of life right now? Some of you have procrastinated on actually following Jesus. Like becoming a, a disciple of his. Learning how to live in his way with his heart. And maybe today's the day that God would sort of jar you out of that apathy and say, no more procrastinating. It's time to step into it and prioritize your spiritual life. I don't know. But I think it would be important for you to answer the question, what's most important in your season of life? Here's how Solomon continues. He says, how long will you lie there, O sluggard? <laughs> when will you arise from your sleep? And if you follow this word sluggard throughout the book of Proverbs, sleep is going to be one of those things that continues to pop up over and over and over again. Here's one of the times it does this in chapter 26, verses 14 to 15. And this is intended to be funny. So if you laugh, that's okay. Here's what Solomon wrote. He said, as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. Right? Like, snooze button. Off completely. Right? The sluggard buries his hand in the dish and it wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. So the sluggard finally gets out of bed, decides to go downstairs for breakfast, pours himself a bowl of cereal, goes to put his spoon in it, and on its way, his way up to his mouth, he goes, that's just too much work. I couldn't even, right? And Solomon wants us to sort of chuckle a little bit and ask some questions about our own life. So the question I have is, is he saying sleep is bad? Because here's the truth of the matter. The University of Michigan discovered something that we've known for a long time, but they reiterated it. Here's what they found in the study they did. Sleep is essential to every process in the body, every single one. It affects our physical and mental functioning. It, are, it affects our ability to fight disease. It affects our ability to develop man, immunity and metabolism. The less sleep we get, the more risk we are for chronic disease. Sleep is attached to everything that makes us healthy. So is the Bible saying the heck with sleep? No sleep till Brooklyn. Like we are just going to go for it. Is that, is that what the Bible's saying? Here's the right answer to that. No. No, what it's saying is that we shouldn't lie around, waste the day, and use sleep as a way to avoid work. That's what Solomon's saying. And I think in general, what he would challenge us to do is to prioritize diligence over laziness. See, diligence says, I will keep going even when it's hard. Um, it's one of the reasons that I love taking my boys out on the backpacking trail every single summer if I can. Because when we're backpacking, inevitably, there will come a moment when the trail is challenging and they would rather turn around than keep going. But I want to train them that life is sometimes really, really hard. And that when it gets hard, we have two choices. Will I tap out and say, it's too hard, I'm done, I'm out? Or will we, what the Bible calls, persevere? Will we push forward? when it's challenging. And I think there's this subtle misnomer amongst many who follow the way of Jesus that if it's hard, God, God must not be in it. The only problem with that is the Bible. Because God is in hard things all throughout the scriptures. And we are called to be people of perseverance. Look at the way that the author of Hebrews puts it. For you have need of what? Endurance. Endurance. Quite literally, it means to um, bear up under the weight of something, the, the weight of pain, the weight of frustration, the weight of something that's really hard, that instead of tapping out to remain under, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. What a beautiful picture 
of being people who prioritize diligence over laziness. And then finally, look at what Solomon said last in this section. He said, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and you may want like an armed, and want like an armed man. Now he's claiming that there are natural consequences for being the sluggard, that we'd find ourselves in want. Now remember, remember, the Proverbs are principles, not promises. Right, right. So we can all probably think of people who it doesn't appear work all that hard and have plenty. You've heard of the Kardashians, right? (laughs) Perception is they might not work all that hard, but they have plenty. And then on the opposite side of that coin, my guess is that you know people that work really, really, really hard, and it just doesn't seem like the chips ever fall in their direction, that they just find themselves in want. So, and let me add, let me add, that there will all be times when all of us are in a position of want or need, right? Where we'll need to rely on others. So some of you, that might be financial help, and you may be in that position right now. I don't want you to feel any condemnation from the scriptures in that. In fact, as a community of faith, on the first Sunday of every month, we take our care fund offering in order to help people in our church body who are out of work or struggling financially. And we love doing that. We're called as followers of Jesus to come alongside people who are in need. And so what Solomon is not saying, he's not saying if you're in need, you're in sin. That's not what he's saying. And he's not saying if you're in need, you must not have worked hard enough. That's not what he's saying. What he's teaching us is that if we do have the ability to work hard and to provide for ourselves and be generous to other people, that we should take full, full benefit of that ability. And so I think we'd put it like this, that being people who work hard means that we take responsibility rather, rather than relying on others. Now, some of you might respond and say, well, Ryan, aren't we supposed to rely on God? And my answer to that is, yes. (laughs) But reliance on God doesn't mean inactivity for us. We sometimes resist work out of the conviction God will provide. And that's true. God does provide, but he often provides by giving us the ability to work. Listen to the way that Charles Spurgeon put it. He's a bit prickly in this, in this, verse, in this um, quote, but I think it's worth reading. He says, In the ordinary affairs of life, my dear brethren, do not go about and put your feet on the fender and sit still and say, The Lord will provide. Because if you act so foolishly, very likely he will provide you with a place in the poorhouse. That was Solomon. That, or that's, that's Spurgeon's words. It doesn't apply to the person who is trying unsuccessfully to get work. It doesn't apply to the person who's sick or injured and can't work. It's written about the person who doesn't want to work but wants to eat. And I think the principle is clear. One of the ways we trust God is by working hard. Which brings us to the end of our time. And at the end of each one of these messages in the Proverbs, I've wanted to say, how does this theme connect to the gospel? How does it connect us distinctly to the work of Jesus? See, we are called to work. Work is a part of paradise. It'll be a part of new creation. And that means that we take initiative. We resist procrastination. We reject laziness. And we take responsibility. And all of those are really, really good things. But please don't miss this. If you hear nothing else today, hear this, that as Jesus followers, we first and foremost must realize that our faith is built on Jesus' work, not our own. This is not a, you can do it yourself, you don't need God, pull up your bootstraps message. That is not where we are landing the plane today. Where I want to land the plane today is on the truth and reality that God shows his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He went to the cross because we could never work our way back to God on our own. The greatest work that your life needed was done for you, not by you. In fact, 
you should probably write that down. I should probably write that down also. The most important work was done for us, not by us. And here's what I want you to capture is that we will never walk into heaven beating our chest, looking around and going, look at all that amazing work I've done. No, 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 no. We will get to heaven and we will see the glory of God. We will see the nail-scarred hands of the lamb who gave himself for us. And we will declare amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? That's our anthem. And we will declare worthy is the lamb to receive glory and power and dominion because he has paid it all. And friends, that work, The work of Christ should not cause us to work less. It ought to free us, not to make an idol of our work, but to work in a way that positions us to to execute our God-given assignment in its season that we might glorify him and walk in joy. Or to say it another way, our work finds its fullest meaning in his accomplishments. Which I think leads us perfectly to the communion table this morning. So I'd like to invite you to start to put your things away and get your communion elements out. If you need um, communion elements, would you just raise your hand and our ushers would love to bring people one that maybe didn't get it. We've got one over here, one up front. Just keep your hand up until you get one. It'd be great. Friends, it's at this table that we remember Christ's sacrifice, his work on our behalf. His work that brings us life and gives our work any sort of meaning or purpose. His work that paid it all. There's nothing left for you to pick up and do. This table is open to all who are followers of Jesus. If you're one of Jesus' followers, then we invite you to partake this morning. And if you're not, I would just invite you to maybe put the elements aside, but more than that, to consider why today wouldn't be the day that you give your life to Christ. The truth is our sin has made a gap in between us and God. And your work alone, your goodness alone, your accomplishments alone cannot bridge that gap. It is only the work of Christ his blood shed for us and the resurrection that he made after that make a way for us. And the scriptures say, if you believe with your mouth or you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. So I'd invite you even this morning to do that. And as we get ready to go to the table, I just wanna give you a moment to search your own heart. Is there anything standing between you and God? Anything standing between you and a brother or sister in Christ. Just wanna invite you to confess that. Let's get ready to go to the table. I want to invite you just to pay attention to those around you. And if there's anybody that's struggling to get um, these COVID-friendly prepackaged communion elements open, if you could help them, that would be, um, I think, what Jesus would want us to do for each other. So just keep an eye out. But on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his apostles around a table. He took bread. He gave thanks. And he said, this is my body. I'm giving for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And he looked at his apostles and he said, this cup is the new covenant, which is made in my blood. Um, 
new covenant, a, a new arrangement between God and humanity. One that is built on his work, not ours. New covenant, covenant of forgiveness in his blood. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the work that you've done on our behalf that makes any of our work meaningful and frees us to work not in order to achieve anything from you, but to joyfully participate with you. You're the one building your church. You're the one who's building your kingdom. You're the one at work in the lives of people that we love dearly. You're the one restoring and repairing And we are so grateful that you've invited us to partner with you. God, thank you for the calling to be people who recognize that you've invited us to work, to to make and to create and to provide, and that we get to do so standing firmly on your love. So Lord, I pray for every single person in this space, that as they leave from here today, that you would allow them to walk out with a deeper sense of meaning and purpose, a commissioning to do exactly what you've called them to do, Lord, in a way that would reflect your way and your heart to bring you glory and to bring them joy. For those of us that you need to stir up, Spirit of God, do it. For those of us you need to calm down a little bit, would you do that? And Lord, our prayer would be that we would align with precisely what you have for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people together say, amen, amen.